Um, I will basically be short and introduce the talk was originally part of a session um, that uh, focused on advanced methods in uh, ground and excited state uh, computations. And uh, Professor Nice's uh, expertise is in quantum chemistry, in particular wave function based methods. And uh, he's been doing some very exciting calculations at the frontier of uh, using coupled cluster uh, methods, sort of a higher level gold standard quantum chemistry, wave function quantum chemistry um, on uh, systems in, in the solid state in the condensed phase. And so this is a very exciting area in our community for both uh, um, validation of, uh, uh, say, plane wave density functional theory advanced methods, but also uh, opening up new uh, avenues for um, exploring the phenomena of, uh, of uh, complex materials. So I'll let uh, Frank tell you more about it. Uh, Frank, please, the uh, floor is yours. And uh, I'll, I'll give you a warning at five minutes. It's about 25 minute talk. Okay. Thank you very much for the kind invitation to come here. And I'm very sorry for the confusion that I caused. It was a family tragedy this morning, and I have to add out. But um, I nevertheless want to embrace the opportunity to tell us a little bit what we did in the field of solids and surfaces. And I do it from the perspective of molecular quantum chemistry. So if I come across a bit amateurishly during the talk, uh, that's the truth. <laughs> so let's look at a molecule or, or a molecular system or maybe also solid through the eyes of a physicist. And it's nothing else but a collection of positively charged nuclei assumed at rest and, uh, and the moving electrons. And what I always find of hypnotic attraction in that field is that a, sim a, a single physical law, namely Coulomb's law, should be able to account for all of the complexity of the material world, or nearly all of the complexity of the material world. And of course, as we all know, since Newton's days, the many-body problem is a hard one in classical physics, and it's uh, even harder in quantum mechanics. And when we talk about first principle wave function approaches, we approach it typically in, in two stages. And first, solving the mean field Hartree Fock equations that give about 99.8% of the correct energy, and <clears throat> introducing the idea of each electron moving in the average field of the other electron and the nuclei. And what's missing from that is just 0.2% of the total energy. It's frustrating that 99.8% isn't good enough. But basically, the, the last 80 years of uh, molecular quantum chemistry has been an uphill battle against uh, the missing 0.2% of the energy, and that is so-called so dynamic electron correlation, basically the instantaneous uh, interaction between electrons when they bump into each other. They come in two flavors, the same spin correlation or Fermi correlation and the opposite spin correlation, namely the Coulomb correlation. And the Fermi correlation is relatively easy because part of it is in the hartree fock and what's really hard is to treat the Coulomb correlation correctly. And uh, how to do that, and how to do that without introducing screening functions or U parameters and all of these things, that is the subject of up initial quantum chemistry. And what has been found to be the most successful method here originated in nuclear physics, where it is less successful than in chemistry, and that is a couple cluster ansatz where the wave function is written as an exponential of an operator t acting on the hartree fock reference wave function. And the operator t <coughs> comes in terms of excitation classes, and these excitations are promoting one, two, three, four particles at a time from occupied hartree fock orbitals into virtual orbitals. And, <coughs> um, and uh, it, it is very fortunate, it's by construction, it is size consistent at any level of truncation of the cluster operator. And in chemistry, we are very lucky that we can essentially truncate <coughs> that, the cluster excitation operator after the second or at most the third term. Now, if you expand the exponential, of course, then you get the linear terms here in those operators, and then <coughs> you get um, products of these excitation operators, and they describe disconnected excitations, meaning statistically uncorrelated events in electron correlation. The coupled cluster uh, um, method is not variational, but it's solved by a projection technique that leads to a nonlinear equation set that is not hard to solve and contains up to the fourth power of the excitation amplitudes. And it is a gold standard method, uh, CCSD parenthesis T, where parenthesis T accounts in a perturbative way for the triple excitations. And that has been tested ad libitum in molecular quantum chemistry and has been found to be a really very accurate method. 
And if you capitalize on couple cluster theory, you can go crazy accurate in these calculations. This is calculation, uh, a method, a uh, compound method of my colleague Jan Martin, and it's based on couple cluster theory, and he shows, and that was more than 10 years ago, that relative to the most accurate thermochemical data available, gas phase thermochemical data available, he, reach, he reaches an accuracy of 0.1 kilocalories per mole, and this is an absolute accuracy. There is no rolling dice here, there is no fitting, there are no parameters, this is just simply natural constants and the Schrodinger equation. And this is what couple cluster theory then gives you. It gives you a systematic way to really solve the many particle Schrodinger equation to an accuracy of about 0.1 ppm, parts per million. And that is, um, and that is amazing. Uh, for very small system, you can go even more accurate, but like couple cluster theory, it, it's what really is solving the Schrodinger equation to that accuracy with no strings attached. Now, what's wrong, of course, about couple cluster theory, and, and you all know that, is that it scales very unfavorably with system size, <clears throat> namely CCSD parenthesis T scales as n to the seventh, meaning if you want to treat a system that's twice as large, you have to invest 128 times the computational resource in terms of CPU time, uh, disk, and memory. And that, of course, many people, uh, I'm very surprised always how many people give this answer to that problem. Then it's, uh, computers, 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 and more computers, but with an n power seven scaling, this, in my opinion, clearly is a losing proposition, and supercomputers don't solve the problem. But instead, I always felt very strongly that it, um, what one should do is to invent intelligent approximations that like, bring down the computational effort so that these calculations become feasible. And it is surprisingly hard to do that without spoiling the accuracy of the parent method. So there have been many, 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 many approximations to the couple cluster equations, but many of them were of a kind that they introduced errors that were far too large to be tolerable, and then couple cluster theory is lost. So essentially, there are three things to be exploited here. The first thing to be exploited is sparsity, and in the self-consistent field, there is sparsity, and by Kuhn's conjecture, the density matrix is falling off exponentially, however, very slowly so. And uh, <clears throat> uh, in the correlation energy, there is a lot of sparsity, and so here you look at pair correlation energy. So these are increments of the correlation energy brought in by pairs of electrons, and you can always write the exact correlation energy as a sum of pair correlation energies. And they fall off extremely quickly with distance. So after about two bonds, like the energy contribution is zero, then there is a van der Waals tail, and then, and then you forget it. So there is very quickly a linear scaling number of significant electron pairs that contribute to the correlation energy. And that is, of course, the basis for local correlation theory. And that alone is not enough, however. And that is where we come in. The, the next thing you need to do is to compress data. I, unfortunately, I don't have time to go into much detail. But rather, the idea here is rather than to operate on large mat matrices that are densely filled with small numbers, you invent a transformation that gives you a, a, a small block of the matrix with large numbers that is densely filled, and the rest is zero, and then you truncate. So it's basically a kind of GZIP operation on the quantum chemical. Uh, uh, information content. And these are the three principles that we have utilized and we have um, invented a method that's so-called DLPNO CCSD parenthesis T and the DLPNO stands for Domain-Based Local Pair Natural Orbital Theory. And uh, if I would explain that to you, the entire talk would be about that, but I want to go to the applications. And what it gives you is linear scaling with respect to system size. Um, so that would be the canonical couple cluster method. That is um, <clears throat> the system size here. It's the number of atoms. And that is the computational effort of DLPNO CCSD parenthesis T scales linearly with system size and with a small prefactor. And so that means instead of being able to treat 10 atoms, you're able to treat hundreds of atoms with that method. And it is now probably the most accurate method that you can apply routinely to molecules and we have worked on this with an entire group for about 10 years. This was the first paper, and since then, the uh, citations here are exponentially rising, and it's on a good way to become one of the really substantially used quantum chemical methods in, in computational chemistry. And it's easy to use. It's black box, just in the same way that DFT is. 
Oops, sorry. Um, you can treat ginormous molecules with that. That was from 2013, was the first time an entire protein has been treated with couple cluster theory. So that was an all electron uh, CCSD parenthesis T level calculation on an entire protein. We didn't really learn anything from it other than that we were able to finish the calculation. But it shows that, uh, <coughs> that these calculations can be done that had been 640 atoms and 12,000 basis functions. That was the first calculation on a molecule over 1,000 atoms. And the last thing we did last year was um, an, um, um, a, a big drug that uh, contained 22,000 basis functions and 2,400 atoms. So basically, the curse of the bad scaling has definitively been overcome with that <laughs> development. And if you subject that now to the standard uh, quantum chemistry test set, so in quantum chemistry, the culture is that you have elaborate test sets containing like hundreds or thousands of data points of high accuracy uh, thermochemical or other data that uh, people run their methods through in order to um, get <coughs> error statistics. And <clears throat> if, you, uh, if you see how, how we're doing that, so DLP and OCCSDT in these tests um, <coughs> do with an average error of about 1 kcal per mole, and so that is chemical accuracy. And this is not by chance, this is by construction. And all DFT, and these are Don Trula's own test sets, so right, I'm not cheating, then is, these are Don Trula's own test set, and it outperforms all DFT, that is clear. Now, how can we do solids and surfaces with that? Of course, um, the proper way to do that would be to go to full periodic implementation of that, and uh, uh, that is scary. Then is I've, I've witnessed, I've, I've seen, I've observed people doing couple cluster theory on solids, and that scares me. <laughs> and, and so what we're doing is, uh, I think, the pedestrian way. We treat the, uh, the, we treat the solid or the surface just like a large molecule. And since we're able to do a few hundred atoms, we can go to very large embedded cluster models. So what we do then, is to take uh, the solid or surface and then we cut out a quantum region and that quantum region can be pretty large. It can be like a few hundred atoms. Then we cap that with capping ECPs. It's all standard technology. And then we embed it in a field of a couple of tens of thousands of point charges. And uh, so basically, we, it, it's very similar to doing a, calcul a QMMM calculation on an enzyme. So basically, that is the way we do it. Now, of course, you tell me that such an embedded cluster is not a solid, and I understand that, and, uh, and I, I know that there are limitations, but there are things you can do with it. And in order to um, convince ourselves that we're not doing nonsense, what we typically do is the following. We do a periodic DFT calculation on the system, and then <clears throat> we vary the cluster size, and we, do, we use the same functional as in the periodic DFT calculation, and then we observe that the cluster, embedded cluster results converge towards the periodic DFT results using the same functional. Right? And if that is the case, and typically it is the case, in the overwhelming majority of cases that we've studied, we really were able to converge the cluster calculation towards a two periodic result at the DFT level, and then we feel entitled to use that converged cluster and apply couple cluster theory to it. And the first study we have done there is a couple of years ago together with colleagues from the TU Munich, from Carsten Reuter. And uh, we have studied uh, small molecule binding to TiO2 surfaces. And uh, <clears throat> uh, my colleague Robert Schlügel tells me that the experimental data on these systems isn't very reliable, but it's the only thing that we found. And so it's, uh, it's what, we, what we connect to. And so there is data for water, for methanol, for CO2, for ammonia, and for, um, and for methane. And for all of these, the binding energies calculated with the DLP and OCCSDT is within one kcal of the experiment. So that is the best comparison we can offer. And uh, <clears throat> the same is obviously not true for DFT that um, is varying all over the place here. Um, for example, here in the water, uh, molecule. So that is the experimental result. Here is the DLP and OCCSDT. And then depending on the functional uh, dispersion corrected or not, you can get all kinds of results from 10 kcal error to relatively close here. That would be B2P, a double hybrid functional that is not really cheaper than the DLP and OCCSDT. So, uh, so th I guess PBE0, D3 would be more something that, uh, that is uh, known to that community. And that has an error of about 4 kcal or so. So it's, it's, it's quite significant. 
Um, for the case of the CO2 adduct, <coughs> um, I think it's, it's well known that DFT always wants the tilted conformation to be lowest in energy, but the experiment shows that the parallel uh, conformation is lowest in energy, and that is also what the DLPNO gives you. So it's, it's in substantial agreement with experiments. So uh, going through a list of functionals, there were always a few functionals that were relatively close to the DLPNO CCSDT for one system, but then not for the next or second next system. So there was not one functional that uniformly performed good. Now, one nice thing about the couple cluster energy that, that I cannot get from the DFT is I can understand it. I can break it down in digestible chunks. And one thing that we have uh, come up with here is so-called local energy decomposition. And the local energy decomposition, what that gives you is, say you have an interaction between two, two systems, whether that's a solid and a surface or an enzyme and, a on, and an effector or a drug, it doesn't matter. And so you have these contact points between <coughs> these two interacting systems. And now the total interaction energy is then, uh, or total binding energy is then just the sum of the interaction energy as these contact points. And the local energy decomposition allows you at each of these points to decompose it into electrostatic contributions, dispersion energy contributions, and exchange contributions. And that is very, very powerful. We, we've been using it in molecular chemistry all the time. And in terms of the surfaces, <coughs> you can see that, and that is certainly not surprising, if you bind water to the TiO2 surface, then the binding is predominantly electrostatic. And if you bind methane to the TiO2 surface, the binding is predominantly dispersion controlled. And quite typically, DFT does relatively well if the binding energy is, um, is electrostatic and it, it varies all over the map if it's dispersion, even if you include the Grimmer dispersion correction. Then, then you see here for the dispersion, like the results are very variable. In electrostatics, it's better, but also you have some really bad results, for example, here with PBE. So that is uh, the story on, um, on binding energies. And um, just to give you an idea, of course, you pay for it. It's not for free. Um, on one point of the largest cluster we've been treating, the PBE calculation takes 30 minutes. The PBE zero calculation takes five hours. The double hybrid calculation takes 12 hours. And the DLPNO calculation takes four days. It is more expensive, there is no doubt about it, but it's still efficient enough to do it in production mode. You just wait a bit longer, but you're rewarded with a systematically accurate result. Now, we've been trying to extend that whole scheme to excited states, and um, that was a, was a very substantial struggle. I think we've made quite some progress along the way, and I want to show you here for the first time what we've, uh, where we stand with respect to band gaps. Uh, so the band gap uh, is defined as the difference between the ionization potential and the electron affinity. Uh, and an alternative definition is the first optical excitation energy. And of course, these things are related. And for semiconductors, the band gap and the optical band gap, they are fairly similar. Now, I can wrap my head around an excitation energy fairly well as a molecular chemist, and, uh, and then many of the things you guys are talking about is, is a bit beyond me. But um, <clears throat> of course, we can approach it this way. Now, um, here's one thing that always confused me, and, uh, and that is very many times you see in, in that literature that people equate band gaps with orbital energy differences, right, from the cone charm orbital energy differences. And then they are happy if, like, they add hartree fock exchange and it gets larger. But I, I don't really know what that means. And it's, look at this here. This is anthracene, and I have the PBE functional that doesn't have hartree fock exchange, and the orbital energy difference between the HOMO and the LUMO is 2.06 electron volts. And if I do a delta SCF calculation by moving an electron and reconverging, I get practically the same. And if I use TDDFT and calculate the first singlet and triplet and then take the average, I also get practically the same. So things are completely fine here. And, and you, it's absolutely OK to use these orbital energy differences as a measure for that, for that excitation. However, as soon as you add hartree fock exchange, that's no longer true. Uh, here, then, the, the orbital energy difference is 3.5 electron volts. And the delta SCF is totally different. And it's, um, and it's the same as the average between the singlet and the triplet excitation energy. And that's OK, 
because in the TDDFT response equation, there is that term here, the fractional heart rate focal exchange, CHF times that integral IA, IA, which is not small. Five minutes is fine. And uh, of course, if you don't take that into account, that is not a physical number here, right? This is a physical number. This is a physical number. The most physical numbers are seen then triplet excitation energies. So one really should look at the states and not at the orbitals. And, and that's why I would never call an orbital a state. Then a state is a many particle object and an orbital is one particle object. And it's, it's absolutely the same is true for, for solids. So if you look at zinc sulfide here or lithium chloride, and that is the difference between the orbital, the orbital energy difference and the excitation energy, and it's several electron volts large. And uh, of course, that is exactly the way it should be. So now, <clears throat> coupled cluster theory for excited states, that is, uh, is a complicated subject. It's the equation of motion coupled cluster in the interest of time. I don't go into it. And uh, there are technical challenges that we needed to overcome, and we ended up with a scheme that's a so-called similarity transformed equation of motion coupled cluster. That's an ingenious invention by Marcel Neuen. And what Marcel has shown, if you apply a second similarity transformation to the similarity transformed Hamiltonian and get the amplitudes from the separate equation of motion IP and EA problems, you can eliminate the, the um, singles doubles block of the transformed Hamiltonian, and then you only have to solve a CI singles, basically a particle whole dimension problem in order to get a fully correlated result. And that is absolutely beautiful. And it's a very accurate method that has an average area and excitation energy in molecular test set of about 0.1 electron volts. And we've been able to implement that in a near linear scaling fashion. And so we now can apply that to a whole range of, of semiconductors here. And uh, so you see that is our range, and this is the range of, of band gaps that has been calculated for them. And again, we do the cluster thing, and we see that in the majority of the cases, um, our calculations, really our DFT calculations are converging to the periodic result, and the coupled cluster calculations are converging to the experimental result. And that is quite beautiful. So <clears throat> if you look at it, so here is our, for the range of systems, these are the hard fog meaning CI singles results. They have a big error of more than one electron volt. Then we do the stem <coughs> coupled cluster that goes 0.2 to 0.3. And once we add the spin orbit coupling, we go, go to an error of below 0.2 electron volts. And compared to DFT, it's, it's way more accurate than DFT. Uh, that depending on the functional, the GGA functionals have errors of more than one electron volt, um, hybrid functionals 0.5 electron volts, double hybrids are a bit better, but the coupled cluster is by far the most accurate. So that is all I had to say. I hope you found it a bit interesting. And uh, <coughs> what I've talked about is that correlated ab initio quantum chemistry can now be applied to systems containing hundreds of atoms, and that allows us to treat large cluster systems and the results of these couple cluster calculations so far, I think, have been quite encouraging, and they do outperform DFT. Uh, I'm aware that the cluster models do not solve all the problems in solid state and materials chemistry, but uh, I think there's a lot you can do with it. Thank you.